Welcome to the Veritas Forum, engaging university students and faculty in discussions about life's hardest questions and the relevance of Jesus Christ to all of life. Thank you, Kimmy, and we are thrilled that you are all here joining this conversation we're going to have tonight with time at the end for your Q&A. Um, We'd love to hear a little bit more about your background. Nathan, you've made the trip over here to Stanford tonight from over the hill on the coast, and you bring a variety of experiences from the business world with you. Please give us a little more background on yourself. Well, it's, it's great to be here. Thank you. Um, uh, you'll know from my accent I'm not from around here. And one of the things I love about Silicon Valley is there is no accent. Everybody speaks funny. Um, <laughs> Uh, well, I studied, um, I actually am an American citizen as well as a British citizen. Uh, my mother's from Denver and my father's from London. Um, but I studied, uh, did most of my secondary education in the UK, studied university in uh, the UK, studied engineering actually, left pretty early, left the field pretty early on because I wanted to make money. Um, and went into business, working in the IT sector for uh, about 18 years, doing um, what's become known as intrapreneurship. Uh, so starting business within larger companies, spotting opportunities, uh, typically being given resources and a budget and like a five-year plan to go away and do things, building a business line and then embedding it back into the mothership and moving on. So that's kind of what I've done in my, my business life. Um, about six years ago though, uh, started Traders One as a response to um, just going out and meeting, having what I call table fellowship with, with the poor, meeting women taken out of human trafficking, people who um, had HIV AIDS and just listening to their stories, but more particularly listening to what good business was doing in um, their situation. And um, it, it changed the direction of my life. Fantastic, and I think we'll hear more about that shortly. And Nishan, Nishan comes from halfway around the world and has a new, another set of perspectives from the Academic Research Institute teaching arenas. Please tell us about yourself, Nishan. Thank you, Debbie. It's good to come halfway around the world and be amongst friends and new friends also. Um, and, and I'm glad as we have this conversation amongst Nathan, Debbie, and myself, to have so many eavesdroppers uh, in the audience. Um, and I hope that you will listen in and ask questions and challenge us later. Also come for the discussion tomorrow uh, that we will have, where we will be able to go into more depth on the issues that we raised today. Um, you know, Debbie, one of the things that is often said critically about con with regard to conversations about poverty and about the poor is that the poor are not included in the conversation. Uh, I want to say I'm not your poor guy. <laughs> I'm, I am from Sri Lanka, which is a, a relatively poor country uh, in relation to the West. Uh, it, doesn't, you know, it doesn't make me poor. I, I have led a fairly privileged existence. Uh, I've done my undergraduate education in the US, my graduate education in the UK, uh, but in Sri Lanka, uh, when you travel on the streets, uh, you encounter poverty in a way that you don't in the West. Uh, you encounter significant levels of deprivation, uh, extreme deprivation even. And you're constantly confronted with what can you do about it. Uh, and you have the added problem of trying to distinguish those, the, the really needy from the pretenders uh, who might also sort of try to beg and take money from you. And also, you know, the people who are addicted to drugs where the money you give may not have much, you know, consequence in sustainably or in a sustained way bringing them out of poverty. I remember one of the things we did as a result of this difficulty we faced in my church was we set up a group that said, you know, every time we meet a poor person, uh, let's have a way to actually connect with them as a group, uh, get to know them a little better, get information about them, and collaboratively uh, go and help them. Uh, and to make sure that the help we give was not something that was just one-off, but had some sustained 
impact and dif made a difference in their lives. Simultaneously, I was working in economic policy research in Sri Lanka. Uh, uh, my undergraduate thesis was on poverty, uh, and a lot of work I did was relating to healthcare and issues that mattered to the poor. Uh, but while there is this need to engage individually, I must say that my research and my thinking, uh, especially currently, uh, through an organization called Verite Research that we started some years ago, has moved towards asking how do we address the concerns of the poor not simply as individual actions, but through macro strategies, uh, through political action, and through public information. Uh, and I want to argue today that that kind of engagement really matters. It is not simply uh, individual acts of charity that matter. Uh, Sri Lanka today uh, has come out of a 30-year war, uh, a 30-year civil war. And one of the major causes of deprivation and poverty in Sri Lanka was the war uh, and the political sort of tensions and differences that actually contributed to it. That political contestation to this day has not been resolved. Uh, there is a huge discourse in Sri Lanka about development, uh, the idea that simply by building roads, by developing people's lives, uh, that we can actually overcome poverty and deprivation. Uh, but we recognize that if you ignore the problems of underlying tension and political conflict, that we will condemn ourselves to actually repeat the deprivation uh, through conflict reemergence. So to argue and give you a picture of the engagement that I'm going to talk about that is not simply of individual assistant, but of dealing with the structures and macro strategies, uh, let me use an example of a person uh, who's at a riverbank. And here's a child in the middle of the river saying, help, help, I've been thrown into the river, uh, and I can't swim. Uh, now, some of you will re recognize that it has some similarity to Peter Singer's uh, moral dilemma of rescuing a child from, from a shallow pond. In this case, the person, but this is a different story. The person swims out, rescues the child. And no sooner does he does, do that, than he hears another child saying, help, help, I've been thrown in. Uh, I can't swim, and he brings that child in, no sooner, and the third child, and the fourth child starts screaming out, which he rescues all of them. By the time the fifth child starts shouting, the person starts running away. And the others ask, what are you doing? We can't swim. Why aren't you saving this child? And he says, I've got to go and find out who or what is throwing these ch children into the river. Because we must take action to prevent poverty, not just to medicate its manifestations. So Nishan, you are coming at this from your own daily living experience in a developing world where extreme poverty is a part of your daily life and interactions and a more macro view. And Nathan, if I could loop back to you a little bit more of trade as one you have elements in the macro, but you're really more of a microeconomist in the sense coming at this from building a business. Um, can you flesh out a little more for us how this interest in poverty uh, developed for you? Yes, I'm, um, I'm a practitioner of social enterprise, not, um, not an expert on it. And uh, I know I'm in kind of uh, a center of world expertise on it, so it is uh, rather... Uh, Nerve-wracking, but yeah, I'm, I'm, I, I, came, I came at this because um, a number of years ago began to get very uncomfortable with just climbing the greasy pole of a career and um, just really feeling a, a real lack of meaning to a, a lot of the things that I was chasing. Um, and that's not to say, I mean, maybe I had a midlife crisis rather early in my life, but um, my, uh, my employer certainly recognized it and let me have a six-month sabbatical, um, during which time I, I was able to uh, free up time and, and just go and, and be with um, 
intentionally trying to find what, what, what was very interesting for me was I, I went during that time back to first principles. I'd inherited a faith, but it wasn't really mine. And I went back and just read um, the New Testament scriptures again. And to my shock and, and maybe uh, horror is too strong a word, but I realized that I had missed good news to the poor, freedom to the captive, recovery of sight to the blind, that if, if your understanding of the message of Jesus does not in a tangible way include this as a clear expression of what your life is about, then it's not authentic. And that really, really disturbed me. Um, and so I, um, I got involved with a group of business people who were absolutely passionate um, that whilst aid has a place, um, business was under, uh, underused in, uh, in ways uh, to uh, address issues of extreme poverty. So we, together, uh, we visited 25 of these businesses on the front lines of, of some really desperate situations, but I, I found in incredible transformation that had happened in whole communities over the course of one, two, or three decades, just through the provision of dignified jobs. And so I thought, well, <laughs> Uh, I can read a balance sheet. I've learned about business risks. This is, some, this is a way for me to connect uh, this theory about what I believe my faith should be a partial expression of and what I do every day. And that, and that was how um, I, I got to m melding those two. And there's this old African proverb that says, the hand that gives is uppermost. Uh, but the hand that shakes is an equal. And this is why I engaged with fair trade, because it was a, a way that the poor were not, were treated as equals. They, they are, it's an exchange of goods and services, and um, they provide products that uh, are, are high, highly skilled, uh, labor goes into producing them that are high quality, and, um, and they are purchased by consumers who have a need for them. So I, that's why I got involved. Well, you, you raise an interesting point there in that, which is the question of your own personal motivation to care about the poor. You know, the title of our talk here tonight, Making Money, Spending Money, What Do We Owe the Poor, suggests that we, first of all, or assumes that we do owe the poor, um, goes even further, perhaps we have an absolute obligation to the poor. Um, Nathan, you've talked about your motivation coming from one of faith, of reading scripture. Nishan, I'd like to hear where, where your motivation comes from. Is, is this interest in poverty something you think is innate in our human nature, or is it learned or taught from a moral or religious perspective? A very good question, Debbie. Um, clearly, there is a natural human sympathy. Um, a sympathy that makes us concerned for the poor when we encounter them and see them. Um, but we don't take this sympathy normally to imply an obligation uh, because this sympathy invokes generosity and lack of generosity is usually not considered a moral failing. Uh, on a more humanistic approach rather than just the human nature approach, we do all place a high value on human life. Uh, humanism, I would say, is a very popular sort of implicit religion of the West um, as a post-Christian sort of embracement. Uh, and, and because we place such a high value on human life, we feel that we have an obligation that goes beyond generosity uh, to actually give up, say, petty luxuries in order to prevent um, death and disease amongst the poor. Uh, but that obligation really doesn't extend to alleviating or preventing poverty, just preventing the most dire consequences of poverty. So even if you think of the philosophical approaches, it is about preventing death or extreme forms of disease. I want to suggest that we have a larger obligation than is implied even by that humanistic approach. Uh, and I personally have two reasons, uh, which we will explore more next time. Let me just mention them to you and uh, elaborate on just one. One is because the 
causes of poverty, which are both historical and current, which are based on actions that are both historical and current, as well as um, the causes of poverty are also global, just as much as they're local. And we profit from those historical and current actions, from those global structures uh, which keep people poor. So we have an obligation, I think, because we are complicit in the creation and the sustenance of poverty in the world in a way in which we may often not be aware of. My second reason is like Nathan's, uh, because if you understand God in the way Christians do, then to love God necessarily implies a concern for the poor and a concern for economic justice, a topic I'll come back to. Let me explain the first issue a little bit. Really, it's a whole talk. We can talk a lot about it tomorrow. Uh, in January this year, the New York Times published a study, uh, actually published the results of about five major studies. <clears throat> uh, basically, the studies investigated this concept of an American dream, which we all know. It means that whatever position you're born into in society, you can rise right to the top. And maybe President Obama is the poster child of that myth or, or that story. Now, what was interesting is that, you know, as economists, we can measure this kind of thing, uh, and that's what the studies did. How, to what extent is the American dream true? It found that in the United States, uh, if you were 42% of people born in the bottom fifth stayed in the bottom fifth. Over 65% of people born in the bottom two-fifths stayed in the bottom two-fifths. And 62% of the people born in the top fifth stayed in the top two fifths. Uh, so really, there seemed to be a great deal of stickiness in terms of movement from one so economic class to another. Uh, what was ironic was that in all the when you looked at all the developing countries, you found that in most other developed countries, developed countries, so to speak, uh, that actually people moved up from the bottom much more. The, the, the people at the bottom, it was, it was much less sticky both at the bottom and at the top. So if you put them on a scale, very ironically, America seemed to be the developed country in which the American dream uh, seems to be least, uh, least in evidence, right? But I'm not trying to criticize America on that basis. My point is that it is like that with the way that uh, between nations as well. The reason some countries are poor and others are rich uh, is not just determined by what happens today, it's determined by what happened in the past, the inherent consequences and situations. Uh, and those things tend to be sticky. Uh, and the, this historic, so I, I'm not going, I'm not <coughs> meaning to say that you know, all of you good people here are not extremely clever uh, and hardworking. Uh, you feel that you deserve the Stanford education and the access and the privilege that you have got. But I mean to say that where you are and what you're able to achieve has a lot more to do with historical birth advantage than you might realize, right? So the only way to understand this stickiness uh, is in terms of the political, uh, uh, political structures, the public policy, the legal systems that advantage those who start rich at the expense of those who start poor. And this, this, this stickiness exists between nations not only uh, because of the history of war making and colonization, which you know we should all be aware of, uh, where would we be today if uh, if California had not been annexed from Mexico in a bloodless invasion right 
uh, and, and all the wealth that it has generated for United States and the people of the United States instead of the people of Mexico as a result. Uh, it's not only because of these historical actions, but also because of present day treaties, WTO uh, systems, uh, access to seabed resources, migration policies, uh, laws that allow capital to move around the world. Um, all of these structures, these global governance, uh, political, economic structures are part of holding in place the inequality of nations. Now, if I might just jump in there. One of the, um, just last month, the UN and World Bank released good news about the progress of the Millennium Development Goals. In 1990, they set out a number of goals with regard to poverty rates, access to education, access to clean water and sanitation for the poorest in the world. And I think there's a slide on this, if it could come up. Um, and in 1990, when these goals were set forth, 42% of the world lived in extreme poverty, a dollar a day or less equivalent income. Today, the goal was by 2010 to have that rate. And the progress, while you do allude to a lot of stickiness, the data suggests there is a great deal of progress happening in alleviating poverty for the poorest. So that today, these poverty levels across the world are not 42%, but 22%, almost achieved um, the goal of having poverty. Um, now, notably, there are some parts of the world that are lagging significantly. This benefit is not accrued across the world evenly. And you'll notice the red and maroon on the map are areas that are significantly lagging, um, notably Sub-Saharan Africa and a few parts of Asia. But China and other nations are making tremendous progress, um, no doubt. It is a very complex picture, as you have painted, Nishan. Um, I do want to go into this a little bit more and kind of explore some of our views of the economic and business systems at work in trying to alleviate poverty. And historically, we've thought of aid, government aid and individual charity as being two key tools. But in recent years, the concept of using business, as you are doing, Nathan, to directly alleviate poverty has come into vogue, and we have seen an entire field of social entrepreneurship emerge. Indeed, we're sitting right here at the business school, which has a center for social entrepreneurship and a brand new institute called SEED, the Stanford Institute for Innovation in Developing Economies, which aims to use business practices and managers and business systems to alleviate poverty. And we're very excited to see that institute emerge and what programs will be implemented on the ground and here at Stanford. So having teed up this range, if you'd flip ahead two slides, I think. Just, yeah. Um, we have a range of business structures that have been set forth now to play a role in poverty alleviation. Um, at the far left, the traditional nonprofit. At the far right, the traditional corporation that might have some compassion for its neighbors and help fund some local schools and, and homeless programs. But in the middle, it, just to give some definition to this concept of social entrepreneurship, we need to recognize there's a whole range from this, the nonprofit that has a little bit of income uh, generated from uh, related programs to businesses started with a social purpose as its primary objective. That would be something like D-Light started here at Stanford out of the Design for Extreme Affordability program. Um, a business that makes money, but its entire focus is providing the poor with safe, clean, renewable energy, getting them off of kerosene. Or socially responsible corporations like Tom's Shoes or Fourth Generation uh, producing environmentally um, compatible cleaning products. So just to set up that there is a whole range under this umbrella of social entrepreneurship. From your viewpoints, Nathan, I'd like to start with yours. 
what business and economic models? Now, we're, we're going to hear, of a, I think, between the two of you, a range of micro models and macro models, including this whole new arena of innovation and social in, uh, innovation. What models are effective at helping the poor? Gosh, um, well, uh, um, I, I, you can look across that, that whole spectrum and you know, there's very, very large companies on the, your right um, that can achieve incredible good with even small changes to their behavior. Um, and that should be celebrated and we should be doing more of it. So, I mean, very often um, CSR, corporate social responsibility, is given a bad name. People think it's just, you know, greenwashing or large corporations that have some publicity problems, you know, just doing something to fix their image. Um, and they think that they can just turn a dial up on this and dial it back. Um, it's actually a ratchet. I don't think it will go back. I don't think consumers will let them go back, so that's good. Um, I think as we get more transparency into supply chains, um, there is going to be, I, I believe most people would be horrified if they were wearing a shirt that came to them through slave labor. And so as we have more and more tools capable of exposing more transparency throughout our supply chains, um, I have a lot of hope that that, that business, um, that business model, large corporations, uh, offshoring production to areas of the world that have very cheap labor costs, um, there will be some real good changes that come as a result. I'm very hopeful uh, about that. Um, equally back on, on social businesses as well, B businesses primarily started to create an impact. Um, I think that's an exciting new class of capital, impact investing. Um, you know, right now it's still fairly early days. We need to, to have far more examples of companies that have proven themselves to be capable of taking investment and giving a return whilst also um, delivering measurable impact. Um, but I think there are examples that, that are out there. Um, interestingly, there's, uh, Kevin Starr wrote re recently in the Stanford Social Innovation Review, just questioning whether it is possible to have, when dealing with the poorest of the poor and meeting some of their most basic needs, whether it is possible to have both a return on your money and meet their basic needs, have impact. And, and I think the jury's out, right? We, we have to say there aren't, there's, there's not a lot of um, evidence, but there is, there's some really exciting things happening in that, that whole space. There's a lot of investors saying, I want my money to go towards some making the world a better place, and, and that's, that's an exciting place to be. My, microfinance, of course, as well, has been longstanding. Um, a, a business way to approach um, providing access to capital to those people who are currently excluded from I any kind of access to capital. Um, so th those, are, those are interesting, interesting ones, and that, but I come not as an expert on these things, just as a practitioner. <coughs> Sean, some of your thoughts on models that... Maybe thanks for challenging me on that uh, stickiness question. Uh, stickiness in relative levels of income doesn't mean that absolute standards don't rise. Even in the United States, the absolute level of income has actually risen over time. Uh, even though there's stickiness in terms of what fifth of the income class that you belong to. Uh, so globally, um, thanks to China mostly, uh, we have seen an improvement or, or a significant reduction in poverty uh, over the last 20 years. China, Vietnam, uh, the Korea. East Asian, East Asian yes. tigers, yes. India sort of catch picking up slowly because these are highly populous countries. That's why rather than picking Vietnam, I say countries like China, because they have very high population, growth in those countries contributes a lot to the reduction of global poverty. Um, and of course, you know, we are challenging China about their currencies and all that, which are the mechanisms by which they are actually managing to alleviate poverty in their countries. So that's something to think about. Coming to this question, uh, I think apart from certification mechanisms that Nathan also uh, sort of actually is involved in through fair trade. Uh, you and mean I, certifying that the good was indeed That's right, produced. mechanisms to certify that this good was produced in a way that 
didn't Benefiting. use slave labor, yes. uh, paid decent wages, etc. Apart from them, a lot of these mechanisms, if, I, if I'm thinking through them correctly, um, sort of come up for two reasons, or these innovations are needed for two reasons. One, because there just isn't enough money being given uh, to prevent or alleviate poverty. And two, uh, even with regard to the money that is given, we don't have mechanisms to get the money uh, from those who have it. Uh, we don't have mechanism to transmit it from those who give to the poor in an effective way. Uh, in economics, we call it the, uh, the leaky bucket syndrome, right? Uh, that is, you know, you can, uh, that giving aid is like putting, uh, carrying water over a long, long distance in a bucket that is, that is leaking. So by the time it gets to its destination, uh, mu much less is there than was put in at the beginning. And to uh, what do you attribute that? Do you attribute so to lack of information, um, a classic economic problem, or to problems of corruption among the hands between the donor and the recipient? Uh, actually, um, you know, study after study has shown that um, a large percentage of aid that is given uh, goes to pay for people and services in the donor country itself. And I mean in the magnitude of 80% plus. Um, part of it is that our time is very expensive. Right? The poor earn a tuppence compared to us. The moment we become consultants on projects, we have to take business class flights across. We have to set up mechanism, these mechanisms to make them work. They account for a substantial part of the costs, uh, our contractors, our efforts, and what we spend. Uh, so the leaky bucket uh, certainly has something to do also with corruption uh, and mismanagement in local destinations. Uh, but it is also because those, those who have uh, transmitted through very costly means. I, and and it's, it's actually you know, quite a scandal uh, when you look at these studies and when you look at the amount of money that has been given in aid over the last uh, 50 uh, or so years, uh, 50, you know, post-World War II, and see how little difference it has made compared to the amount of money that has been given. Uh, but we need transmission mechanisms, uh, ways to get people to give and deliver it cheaply and effectively. Uh, some of my friends uh, were involved in an Oxford Business School case study where they looked at how UNICEF came up with this creative method uh, where they partnered with Procter & Gamble uh, who said, who told mothers of young children for every uh, packet of Pampers that you buy, it's nappies for very little kids. We will donate one uh, tetanus vaccine. Uh, it's a maternal and newborn tetanus vaccine, which is a major killer in some poor countries. We will donate one tetanus vaccine. And this was a great success. Over six years, they've managed to donate 300 million uh, tetanus vaccines. Uh, because really what it did was it, it, it worked on the self-interest of Procter & Gamble that found this is a great marketing technique for Pampers, uh, worked on the sense of uh, guilt and also sensitivity of young mothers who more acutely than you know, any others in society would feel young children should be protected uh, from tetanus uh, to actually create a transmission mechanism. So I think uh, that these methods in that sense are dealing with the secondary problem of transmission, uh, not necessarily the primary problem of poverty prevention, uh, but it's important. I, I don't mean to knock it. Uh, but, but the problem we are trying to fix here is the leaky pro bucket problem and the inadequate giving problem. Uh, in short, solutions to the apathy and the self-interest of the rich. Uh, the solutions are important. We, as, a, as an economist, I, I really believe in working out the right incentive mechanisms, uh, putting them in place. But I want to encourage us also to think beyond the question of transmission, uh, 
to the question of transformation. Uh, that's a topic maybe I, if I have time I can go into or can come back to. Uh, but we need to engage in, method, in a model. We need to ask what are our models for transformation, not just our models for transmission. Uh, Give us, give us a picture of what okay. transformation means. So we need I, some definition Yeah, this is something that's actually informed by my own sense of, uh, my, my, my own Christian background and my understanding. Um, really, um, when we talk about Jesus, uh, it's, it's quite an amazing or, or an absurd thing we announce that God emptied himself of his glory and took on human form uh, and appeared on earth as a human being. That God became, that God's way of intervening or breaking into human history to, to fix and correct uh, the problems of humanity was to actually become human himself. Uh, and shockingly, uh, when he did that, he didn't appear as a baby in the palace of King Herod. The three wise men who were looking for Jesus made the mistake and went to the palace, palace of King Herod, uh, thinking that's where he will be with fairly disastrous consequences because King Herod proceeded then knowing that somebody that might challenge him was born to actually kill a large number of uh, young children. Um, and actually you can see that during, even during colonial times, Christian missionaries, there were a substantial number of Christian missionaries who engaged in poverty and in social change with that kind of sense of emptying themselves and relocating themselves uh, within the cultures and societies that they were trying to help. So we know from studies done in Yale, et cetera, that the preservation of a lot of African languages is due to the presence and work of Christian missionaries who gave their lives to actually decoding those languages, uh, writing them, translating things into those languages. The building of a vast amount of uh, educational institutes in the world, uh, health uh, hospitals, that still remain centers of excellence were missionary endeavors. Even in the United States, if you look at the top 100 universities, most of them were started with, by missionaries and, and Christians who had a sense of the importance of education uh, for the country and, and, for, and for transforming the world. So actually, um, I would say that uh, this embedding uh, and assisting, uh, the Christian model of helping is not simply to operate from a position of power uh, and give, but actually, if you look at the Jesus story, it is the idea that God embraces weakness and powerlessness. So he's not born in the palace of Herod, he's born in Bethlehem. <coughs> and the, the song goes, you know, this insignificant town of Bethlehem. Why there? He's born to parents who are poor, radically identifying with the weak in the world. So wherever I have seen Christians engage uh, with poverty in this, in this way, I have seen them actually taking risks uh, of, of transplanting themselves, their lives. I had a story only two days ago uh, from Pete Summers of a young Stanford PhD graduate who's about to graduate in mechanical engineering uh, who actually was so poor, his father was a truck driver and too poor to buy him his plane ticket to come to Stanford. Uh, so he had to find trucking assignments that brought him to this part of the country in order to bring his son over here. Uh, he studied mechanical engineering, is almost finished, has great job offers in the valley, but he decided, he and his wife and little baby, they said, we want to move to China and teach in a university there and transplant some of the knowledge and abilities we have into that context and into that community. Uh, if you've read Stiglitz's book, uh, you hear about uh, this lawyer who worked for the World Bank. Uh, and uh, when he went into Botswana soon after, you know, Botswana got its independence in 1966, in 1969, 
Uh, Botswana has lots of diamond mines, and De Beers, the gr big South African multinational, signed a contract for $20 million to take control of Botswana's diamond mines. In the first year, De Beers made $60 million in profit. So a 300% return in the first year. Okay. Uh, this lawyer who went in, who sort of went on a World Bank assignment, argued strongly, saying this contract should be renegotiated. As it happens in the halls of power, De Beer, the multinational, of course, spoke to the World Bank and said, you know, this is not right. And World Bank wrote a letter saying uh, this lawyer and what he's saying does not represent the advice of the World Bank. And the government of Botswana said that's precisely why we're listening to him. Right? So whose side of the, t on what side of the table are you? Uh, and whose side are you on? Um, I think the transformation model which, which, which I've had a chance to sort of work on um, uh, by going back to Sri Lanka, the World Bank in Sri Lanka offered me jobs a couple of times. Um, and I said no because it was easy. I knew that that's not the, I, I don't, the World Bank's a great institution. I don't want to knock it. Uh, many friends who work there. Uh, it does a lot of good and you know, maybe does some harm as well. Uh, these things happen. Uh, but I, I knew that that's not the side of the table I wanted to sit on uh, when I wanted to work in Sri Lanka. Um, and I think that was informed by my own instincts uh, of faith. Um, and I think that's something that we can explore more, not just say how do we work on mechanisms of transmission, but how do we work on transformation and where our lives become a part of that Transforming, uh, transforming reality, in which not only the poor and the people we go to are transformed, but we are also transformed. So you have both pointed to evidence of, of opportunities for transformation, Nishan, with the opportunity to embed yourself in the community and have an impact at a level that overcomes these systemic issues of corrupt government and systems that don't get the funds and resources there. Um, Nathan, you as well, you spoke of a sense of your own transformation in reading scripture through faith, coming to see a way that the poor achieve a sense of dignity by producing a, a good and your work at Trade is One to help create markets to, to realize um, benefits to those uh, businesses. My question is, I think I'm going to move this a little bit more to the, the personal level. How do we, and how do you suggest people sitting here listening tonight, make that connection for themselves? How do we develop or, or achieve a, a personal connection with poverty? We are sitting here on a multi-million dollar, beautiful brand new campus. There are some inherent barriers for us to experience what it is like to be in the other person's shoes and see some of the kinds of solutions that you have seen. Um, so I'd, I'd like to actually turn the question around. Are there things we should be learning from the poor? Are there ways in which we ourselves are poor and need to turn the question inside out? Uh, yeah. I. I... Now, I, I, uh, I what I didn't say about my childhood is I grew up um, in India and Iran and, and was exposed to uh, poverty uh, as, as a child, but it was only as an adult when you... I, I think you have to smell what one dollar a day means. I think you have, you know, to really understand uh, what Bono calls just stupid grinding poverty. You have to, you have to see the syringes in the dirt and the condoms and see the children in bare feet running through that um, and the human feces and just see, um, see the dehumanization that occurs as a result of that. I think you have to stop our overly complex, busy, overscheduled lives and just listen and, and have fellowship with with the poor and go with no agenda. I mean, that's that kind. That's what that's what I did to to listen, 
And in my, my own training, you know, and I'm sure it applies to, to you here too, you know, you, and for good reasons, you know, we're taught about, you know, how you can be master of your own destiny and come up with a brilliant new idea and, you know, have strategic plans and tripwire budgets and, you know, um, and, you know, it's interesting in, when, you, when you're actually with, with the poor, the exuberance, the, the, the lust for life that they have, the, the simplicity of life as well, there's a, it, it really starts to make you question a lot of the things that you take for granted and, and what, you, uh, what you think should be normal. And, and when it comes to, you know, making impact, I, you know, I want impact, I want it to be fast, I want it to be big. That's what we're taught about, right? And Silicon Valley, right in the heart of it, right here, Stanford, incredible things have happened as a result of people studying here at Stanford. And you know, I, I think, I think the, the Bible is unimpressed by size and speed and, and impact. It has this, as Nishan was saying, this very, very strange, mysterious, Jesus says some, some very odd things. Um, he says he's come to give us life and life abundantly. And then he says, and if you want to find it, uh, then you have to lose it. Um, and then he goes on to say, and if the way you do that is you follow me, and the, if you're going to follow me, you pick up a cross, you deny yourself. In other words, all the entitlement that I think I'm, is due me, you, you give that up, and he says you follow me to a cross. Um, very, very strange, hard words, but somehow in that... Um, that surrendering of the narratives that play in our head, and I have them, like, you know, my business should be at this stage by this point in time, and we need investors, like, you know, I, I've done the spreadsheets, I've done the pitches, and, I, and I've, I've run businesses, and there's multiple millions of dollars that I've made for companies that I've worked for, but, you know, in this area of um, dealing with the poor. Jesus takes the side of the poor not to condemn us rich, but to invite us into, uh, into understanding, uh, in, into fellowship. So th there is always inclusion whenever he deals with them. A, lo a lot of religious practice is about saying we owe something to them and we need to give, yeah. give them something. Um, but Jesus' approach is very different. He, he always looks at the exclusion that happens as a result of leprosy or extreme poverty or the fact that she is a whore. And he has fellowship with them and brings them in. And I think if, you know, if we're looking personally at uniting meaning in our lives um, with what we do, I think it is so important to spend time in that mysterious place where there is weakness and we admit we are not masters of our own destiny. And, um, and for me personally, I'm still learning a lot about what it means to, um, at the point of seeing some of the darkest things and, and meeting a girl who at, uh, in 10th grade is sold by her parents into a brothel. She is put in a room chained like an animal until the person with the highest bid will bid for her virginity. She's then raped, and that rape gives the brothel owner probably what he paid for her in that one act. And then for years after that, 18 months to two years, she is systematically raped for profit 10 to 30 times a day. Um, And yet to see that woman having been rescued and, and taken through healing um, is a deeply moving experience, but it calls into question the, the things that we have um, just taken for granted as being due to us, and yet with six billion people alive today, brothel owners can throw, I mean, slaves used to be, they used to be owned, legal ownership of people. That doesn't happen these days. 
um, what happens is just like a commodity, just when our iPod is broken, you throw it away and you buy a new one, you do exactly the same thing to a human being. And I believe Jesus, God, hears the cries of those people being thrown on the trash heap. And if, you, if we want to find God, we find him on that trash heap, we find him amongst the poorest of the poor. And things have happened in my life, I've seen what I would say are miracles happen, but only as I have let go of this narrative of success and significance. And as Nishan was saying, go through this process of emptying and you have fellowship with the poor. You've just provided a very powerful story of emptying yourself out, um, what, what that means. It's a painfully vibrant um, picture. And, and another paradox is that, and I don't know how this works, but we find our deepest joy. And I'm not, I don't mean happiness. I don't mean we find our deepest joy at those points of intersection of deepest need in the world that I can be weeping over the story that a woman has, is telling me and weeping for the injustice, because I know Christ weeps, and yet knowing somehow that those, if those are God's tears, I know he has the last word on this and that we are on the winning side, even as those tears flow, that's the point of deepest joy as we surrender our lives to, to bring about that transformation. And that transforms us as well as the concrete acts that transform the human experience amongst the poor as well. So uh, uh, there is a common brokenness here that we find in our condition surrendered, I think is what I hear you say, that meets the brokenness of the poor. And as we of... let go of these narratives of how things are meant to, even as I run Traders One, I want strategic plans and I want to know, you know, you're just hard what you're trained to do this. But as we let go of those narratives, I think there becomes a, um, a freedom to say, uh, I will be obedient. I will l try to love the Lord my God with all my heart, my soul, my mind, my strength. I will bring everything to the table. But at the end of the day, the results are not mine. They're someone else's problem. And I can, there's freedom in that. And as you empty yourself and just say, it's like the child with a lunch, Jesus says, just takes that. And this boy's lunch feeds 5,000. It's... it's it's very difficult to explain, but the, but the freedom that it, that it allows you to succeed or fail at whatever you think you're doing, but to place that in his hands and just say, I'm like a child here, and this is all I have. Do with it whatever you want. And do we have time for one more question before we open to the audience? I want to take it to a, a practical level, perhaps, for people here listening tonight. We have undergraduates, we have graduate students um, who are seeking both meaning for their own lives, for themselves, a sense of purpose, but this is a generation that wants to have an impact and do something meaningful for others. What advice would you offer them from the path you two have individually, personally been on to connect, find meaning for yourself, and have an impact? A tough question. There's so many <laughs> options there, but I would love to hear. Okay, um, I don't know whether you all are all aware of this. You know, we, we all know the financial crisis and the meltdown of the financial markets. Um, when I graduated from Harvard in 1994, it was the heyday of investment banking. What happened in 2008 was set up in the 90s. Um, Anyone from a good college with half an IQ, it didn't matter what you had studied, could be architecture, English literature, investment banks wanted you. <laughs> um, everyone I knew was joining an investment bank. I, I had the 
you know, certainly it was more money than I would have ever seen, have ever seen even. Um, uh, I, you know, I was tempted. I couldn't and didn't because this little voice in my head that said, you know, your God is not someone who takes from the poor and gives to the rich. Uh, I, was, I was acutely conscious or aware that I had come from a poor country, uh, from amongst poor people, and I asked myself the question, who will be served by my work? Who will benefit from it? And the answer was, well, rich people will get richer. Um, and it, it, you know, it, it was just not possible, <laughs> tempting as it was, uh, to make that step. What I want to tell you is that we all have ideas that let's first make the money. If you have money, you can help the poor. Uh, look at Bill and Melinda Gates, how much they can do for poverty uh, because they've made this whole load of money. Uh, but like what happened with investment banking and unraveled in 2008, the making of money uh, isn't innocent. Uh, when we make money, uh, we actually, do we ask questions about what consequences uh, occur in the process of that money making? Have you asked questions about Microsoft? Uh, when I had to do my PhD, I had to actually drop Microsoft because there's lots of mathematics uh, in economics PhD and use something called LaTeX. Um, which all of you all know very well. Uh, but as you know, LaTeX really, you know, exists, is, is a fabulous thing to work on. Um, uh, and, and costs no money, has come into the world through sort of open source mechanisms and existed. Uh, open Office, which rivaled Microsoft, which I used for a while, I found often was hobbled because every time Microsoft upgraded, they changed their RTF uh, sort of codes to make it not interoperable with OpenOffice. So your rich text formatting couldn't talk to each other, uh, and OpenOffice had to develop another. The Microsoft monopoly uh, in the world that has, has, has consequences in actually taking away, I mean, they're under severe uh, competition regulatory sort of uh, lawsuits in the, by, by the EU regulator itself. Uh, but Microsoft is so rich that they keep fighting these lawsuits forever and a day. Uh, because the monopoly position of Microsoft has been constantly used uh, to keep away other operators, to prevent other people being able to manufacture and operate uh, in what is now actually a public platform because it is a common platform. Uh, so this making of money whether it is, you know, do we ask when we make money on the stock market, you know, where did it come from? Did it come from weapons manufacturers that sold, you know, light arms to, uh, you know, children shooting each other in the Congo, right? Did it come from uh, pon the pornographic industry? Did it come from the tobacco industry? Uh, we have some ways for asking those questions, but... Uh, that is how we make money. I'm on the executive board of an international Christian organization. We would not have taken the $150 million that was given for seeds easily. Uh, we would have probed it and said, can you tell us where this money came from? Because if we are not satisfied that this money doesn't carry with it uh, the possibility of having been gleaned uh, through serious harm, to other people, then we, we, we get offers, very large monetary offers, that we decline because you know, it is difficult to know uh, that this money, you know, we've all seen the film Blood Diamonds, right? So that it doesn't have, it's not blood <coughs> money in that sense. Uh, so I think when we have this tension and say, first make money and then help the poor, we must be, we must be aware. And we must also recognize that it's not our money that's going to solve the problem. Uh, that we must actually be willing to engage transformationally and give up of ourselves. So what I want to say lastly, Debbie, is that the Christian understanding, uh, an idea of sin and evil, isn't limited to our conscious individual actions, ignoring history and context of our situations. It takes all that in. Uh, and it recognizes that we are hopelessly complicit uh, 
in the evil and injustice in our world. I don't think we have much choice about it. I am. Uh, we all are. Um, and es especially when we are not its victims, and we are not. So think about it. I mean, you talked about both human trafficking and the sex industry. It is not completely unconnected to even occasional forays into pornographic websites, signaling demand and driving up the advertising. But it's more than that, because we benefit constantly from the structures that cause others to be in poverty, uh, from industries that exploit poor laborers, because international capital, as you know, is free to get about asking who can work the cheapest for me, but the reciprocal uh, capacity for walking about saying who can pay me the highest wage is not available because we demand, we call that you know, illegal immigrants immediately, where people are asking simply to work uh, for an uh, honest wage and to get a dignified existence by simply a device of law uh, that makes them illegal. Uh, Kiran Desai in her book, Inheritance of Loft, had this beautiful picture of Biju, this Indian man who had come to work in the US to do one of the dirtiest jobs of cleaning restaurant floors and bathrooms. Now, he was hired precisely because nobody would do such dirty jobs in the US for such a low wage. And yet, he was denied a visa or, or a, a legal status because they said you have to prove that nobody in America can do your job. <laughs> Obviously, anyone can do their job. So we, do, we, ex we extend a brain drain on, on, on poor countries and poor communities. We, we allow their doctors, their engineers, uh, their rich to come into our societies and contribute to it, and we keep the poor there and have taken the very people that can help contribute to alleviating and changing their circumstances, their businesses, uh, out of those countries and made them part of our progress and our growth and our success. So our first response as Christians to poverty in the world is not charity, but repentance. It is to examine how our lifestyles, our decisions, our sources of wealth, what is done in our name by our governments, and what was done in the past as well, not just now from which we be benefit, are all fundamentally and causally connected to the poverty and deprivation of our world. When you're young, and when I was young, too often we want to run out and do something. Fix the problem, contribute, do a soup kitchen, go to Latin America, go to Africa. Uh, that's a sweet but lazy response. I want to say uh, that I would first ask you to take a step back and understand better the causes of poverty and deprivation in the world and to reflect our own complicity and where it comes from. Otherwise, however well-intentioned you are, you may continue to become a part of the problem than a part of the solution. A challenging question. We can talk question. more about this yes. tomorrow. Yes. Yeah. And in your program, there's a reference to two follow-on sessions tomorrow. Um, Nisham will be speaking in Old Union Circle Common Room uh, at 5 p.m. And Nathan, the same place at 7 p.m. Titles of their talks are, are here. And Nathan, your thoughts, advice, how to <laughs> I get knit the this difficult problem together for us individually without feeling like the systems are working so against us that there's nothing we can do. Yeah, I get, I get the question a lot. Um, and there is, obviously there's no perfect answer. Everybody's different. Um, if some people want to go out and get lots of experience and make a lot of money so they can go and give it away, um, that's perhaps a valid way. And, I, and, I, and for sure, there's, there's really, really important skills to be learned through education, through experience in business and whatever business is to be used to bring real meaning and healing to a very broken world. Um, uh, but I, I, you know, I just from my own experience, I would say that the, the trying to unite one's life's work, what we do, with both 
how we are wired, which means that we have to have a reasonable amount of self-awareness. Um, and with what I think are the intentions and the purposes of God, is a, that's a very sacred thing. Um, and to echo Nishan's advice, do it very slowly. Uh, we are far too keen to jump in and start another nonprofit or go do something. And one of the one of the questions I want to ask God when I see Him, assuming that I do, um, is why He seems to be on such a completely different wavelength to me. Like I think that the problems are huge, they are urgent, and they need fixing. And he doesn't seem to be in as much of a hurry as I am sometimes. Um, but there is, an, there is a necessary slowing down, I think, that I needed to do to be both self-aware and aware of things of how the world is broken, what, where, aware of, uh, of the world. Um, also aware of the way in which God does things. Like we think he should go and do something huge and maybe he's calling us to do something which will end up in us being anonymous for the rest of our lives, maybe having very small impact, maybe things that we don't really like, but that might be the point at which we find the deepest fulfillment and joy. Mother Teresa was a saint, not because she solved poverty in India, but she got up every day and knew what she felt God had called her to do, and that's all she did. Um, and so... Uh, I, I would say that process, need, we need wisdom at that. And what I would do, d intentionally met with people, some people on a weekly basis, I was just in that kind of group, some on a monthly basis, other different people, uh, one person on a quarterly, and, and another person that I met kind of annually. And it was very interesting. And I surrounded myself at a time when I was thinking, what do I do? Do I change the direction of my life here? surrounded myself with people who had both experience in the direction that I was perceiving I might go um, and who were not afraid of telling me some pretty brutal truths and telling me, I think you're wrong there and you're not suited. And it was, it's, it's great to have that wisdom in your life because when you have people meeting with you on a weekly or monthly basis, they can hold you accountable to things that you think you are going to go and do which is great, but the people who watch your life unfold on a quarterly or annual basis, it's like freeze frame photography. They can spot things that other people can't, uh, and they bring wisdom into um, this process of discernment um, that was really, really important to me. Uh, so, I, and I would also say lighten up. I think I believe in, I believe, I, it was important to me to believe that, you know, as heavy as a change of direction of my life was to me, and I have a family, three boys, you know, it wasn't just me going off and doing something crazy. It had implications on other human beings too. Um, I had to believe that God would be big enough to make up for either stop me doing something really dumb or um, fix things that I had done that were really dumb and to relax in that, that freedom as well. Well, thank you both. You've given us a lot of food for thought. And um, Kimmy, are you going to step in for a moment here? Yes. Um, thank you for the discussion. Uh, right now, we'll switch gears and um, start our Q&A. Uh, so our first two questions are reserved for the Buddhist community and the Islamic society at Stanford. Um, after that, the floor will be open for Q&A. So if you, are, if you have a question, please come to the two mic stands close to the front of the auditorium. Um, we'll give priorities to students. So um, maybe if you don't have a burning question right now and if you're not a student, you can withhold a little bit. Um, let our students ask the questions first. So um, could the Buddhist representative please get ready? Okay, and uh, I'll now pass the stage back to Great, Debbie. Thanks. Thank you. All right, do we have someone from the Bo yeah. Buddhist community? Please. My name's Hannah. I'm from the Buddhist community at Stanford. Um, 
You've covered so much. I, Debbie actually stole my question. <laughs> um, so I, I was scrambling to sort of come up with, with a different one. And I'll, I'll just start with a few comments um, that, about the talk that moved and touched me. Um, particularly um, what Nathan was saying about, about giving up our personal narrative, um, our, our uh, sense of how things are supposed to go. Um, I really resonated with that and, and I th thought that that might be sort of a, a different model for um, the idea of, of voluntary simplicity is something that I think about a lot and, and I think as Buddhists um, we tend to consider like how um, how can we live a more simple life so that everyone um, can have less suffering? Um, and I think, and and we also sort of draw a uh, a connection between our own personal sort of our ego's investment in in the the outcomes of our work uh, with suffering. So the more we cling to how things come out and, and how, um, you know, how we end up looking in the end, you know. <laughs> the more we, we suffer when things go wrong or when, you know, when, you know, God or the greater universe takes things into its own hands and makes it go very differently. Um, Can I so, put you, hold, yeah. hold there and just have yeah, sorry. Nathan respond <laughs> Thank you. to you? What's going was, on a bit there? <laughs> that was very thoughtful. I really appreciated that. Um, and it, it unites something that I often teach about, which is, um, I, I think, from, from at least my faith tradition, when I consider wealth and how we are entrusted with it, if we have it, um, I believe um, both the Hebrew Scriptures and the New Testament um, have, a, have a framework for us to look at that, and that does involve living simply, giving generously, and buying ethically. And by buying ethically, I mean building what the Bible calls righteousness or acting rightly, justice and compassion into our economic systems and making sure that, as Nishan said, there is not exploitation that happens as a result. So those three things, I think, have to come together. We, this... Everything that we are experiencing right now, we know, is not sustainable. The, the conversation probably needs to move away from a sustainability to survivability right now. Um, and the only answer to that is going to be a, a much simpler lifestyle for us. Um, no question. And is there a representative from the Islamist student group here? Hi, uh, I'm Waqas. Uh, I'm the president of the Muslim Board at Stanford, uh, which also forms, includes the Islamic Society. So um, this is an excellent discussion. Um, I was actually really impress impressed by some of the questions that uh, Nishan raised. They were really thoughtful. Now, Nathan mentioned that there has to be some equality in how we deal with the poor. Um, why is that consciousness, this awareness of this, missing in uh, the larger framework of government and how they interact with the poor. As in, why is there something wanted in return? Not even just an equality in giving, but a, a requirement of something in return, be it, um, be it um, market or material access or, or support for some policy. Um, and I find this really perplexing because in light of this discussion that we're having today, it seems like there are two faces to, to, to this effort. Um, could, you know, both of you, if you could comment on that. I, I think you're, you're asking about the transactional nature of foreign policy that gives aid with one hand and asks for political support or benefits on the other. Yeah. Um, that is a very serious problem, uh, I think, globally. Uh, for the credibility of the values that we all support. Because when labor standards or human rights conditions are imposed selectively on countries uh, that are our friends and not on our, uh, that, that, are, that, are, that are not our friends mm -hmm. and not imposed on countries that are our friends, 
the credibility of the whole value system is at stake uh, because these actions now are not seen as, uh, you, you know, human rights and labor standards are seen as imperial measures rather than as the value propositions they should be seeing. Why is it that we can make so much noise about, say, Iran, uh, but be so quiet about Saudi Arabia, which by far is the most oppressive regime in the Middle East, which is most rapacious in the way it actually monopolizes the resources of that country for a very small elite, uh, which has horrendous uh, sort of legal system uh, that can declare capital punishment and other kinds of brutal punishments uh, without a proper hearing uh, to its people, and a lot of Sri Lankan workers in those countries have suffered that also. Uh, why is it that we can accept such, such horrendous behavior uh, and then go pick on uh, some, and is completely undemocratic as well, right, Saudi Arabia, uh, but we go pick on other countries. So it, it's clear, even to people in Iran or the people in the Middle East, that this is a sort of game. Um, and I think that's why I say if you, you know, you may not need to go to South Africa, you may need to go to the State Department and get involved in the nature of your foreign policy. Because the greatest service that you can do people like me who live in countries where in fact there's a huge violation of human rights, uh, but popular opposition to any American resolution against Sri Lanka on the basis of human rights because of perceived American hypocrisy. If you can, you can help us not by moving international resolutions against our regimes, uh, but by actually helping America to have more integrity in the way it functions in the world uh, and, the, and the way it does business. So, I, so that's why I said this requires deeper thought. And thank you for- Thank you for your talking. question. Yeah. Thank you. I, over to this side, we'll try to alternate. Please. Hi, um, thanks so much for your thoughts. I was just curious about, I think more along what Nishan was saying, um, that there are system, systemic problems that cause poverty. Um, so, you know, capitalism can do terrible things to people, especially when it's in the pursuit of pure profit. Um, but yet the examples of what students should do were all sort of very individualistic and it just strikes me as, in some sense, ironic because Christians have been so central in huge movements for justice, such as the abolitionist movement, the prohibition, the civil rights movement. Why not encourage students to start a movement to demand justice and not just, I understand the role of personal repentance, I understand the role of um, personal complicity, but why not say, let's all get together and demand for specific changes? Excellent. Tell me your name. Oh. Um, my name is Rachel Wright. I uh, study domestic poverty here at Stanford. Rachel, that's, that's a fabulous observation. Um, I'm sorry if I implied that the only responses you can have are personal ones. Um, I, may, I think we were speaking into the context of saying, take time to think and understand the problem. Uh, but in addition to what you're saying, the whole movement for labor standards uh, globally was spawned off by students getting up and asking, well, where does my campus in clothing with campus insignia, where does it come from? And some students visiting the sweatshops in which these clothes were made and saying, hey, ho, no more. We can't get uh, clothes with campus insignia from sweatshops in the global south. And that spawned a movement that then became the FLA on one side, the campus movement on another, uh, and then global movements. So, so I think the, I, would, I, would, I would echo Rachel to say that we don't have to wait till we grow up. Um, or say, we, we, we can't simply say, look, I got to finish my PhD first. I've got to get good grades first, I've got to get, to get a good job first, because that story will never end. You'll need a promotion, you'll need a house, you'll need a wife, husband, children, they'll need to go to college first, uh, you'll need to have your retirement income done, 
uh, that you, you should say, you should ask, how can I become available as I am? And students, and, as students, have become, have been in the past a great force for social and economic change, and that power is still with you. Yes, question over here. I'd like to offer a quick four to five enumerate, PC enumeration of the different motivations that might drive somebody to uh, attack poverty, and I'd like your commentary on whether it's comprehensive, A, and whether it's valid. Number one would be self-interest, either treasures in heaven or just self-preservation here on earth. Number two would be compassion, either by personal experience and empathy or just naturally having that kind of uh, disposition. Um, number three would be a sense of morality, a sense of obligation that has been instilled by other experiences in the past. And number four would be, why am I forgetting it? Yeah, those would be the, the three. Oh yeah, number four would be imitation of uh, people that you've seen in the past that you're simply trying to role model. Would you comment on the validity and comprehensiveness of that list? So again, motivations for a concern for the poor, yeah. to take action, to be concerned, self-interest, compassion, morality or obligation, and imitation of others. I had three of those four that I had notes on that I, were going, I was going to talk to given the time. So I think, <laughs> well, not bad, here but is you, your you got more than me. <laughs> <laughs> I didn't get imitation. <laughs> Um, yeah, I mean, self-interest for sure. Um, I'm not sure we need to go into that much more, but, you know, increasing uh, wealth in very poor nations in, uh, means that women have less children, it's very clear. So, so there is a self-interest uh, here that we can reduce the growth rate of uh, the world population by sharing wealth more equally. Um, and also the gross inequities that exist um, results in, in, in real uh, retributive acts, whether or not that's terrorism or whatever. So there, there is self-interest, compassion. I, 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 I don't know if I've got time now. I, I love all of these, and I could go into them uh, a, maybe a bit more later, but I, th I, I really like that. What I would like to know afterwards is just maybe unpack imitation a bit more from you. Quick, <laughs> I'll look at my notes. Uh, moral obligations, as you talked about, has many sources, a sense of moral obligation. Uh, so sometimes it, it, it's sourced from philosophical discussions. And I think the problem with even the Peter Singer type utilitarian philosophical argument uh, for moral obligations is it stands as a fairly cold, logical argument that tells us what our moral obligations are. But I think we, are, we may need to ask, what is it that aligns our interests or our instincts and our desires with those things that are our moral obligations also? That you may get more from your culture or your faith background, whatever it is, and, and different people, depending on their background and faith, will have different uh, different ways of attaching themselves to different moral obligations. The one big question to ask is, Stanford as a university and you all as students are constantly talk about you know, helping the poor, getting involved in alleviating poverty in the world. I want to know from you, what is the motivation that feeds that rhetoric on this campus? How deep does it go? Uh, you're saying it's all three, but, but, but really, how do we nourish that motivation and give it depth and roots? That might be a challenge that we need to take on. Over to this side. I had kind of a, I guess, more macro question in terms of poverty. There are certain economic institutions that we know are highly correlated with um, income per capita, uh, literacy, lower child mortality, you know, those sorts of positive things. I'm, I'm thinking of things like property rights or legal structures, um, but there are others. Um, but if you look at the data, you see, as you mentioned before, a, gr a great amount of stickiness in terms of economic institutions over time within a country. So I was just wondering your thoughts about um, 
how one might go about actually changing some of these economic institutions that are in a country or how, how we could go about moving the ball forward. At, at a more policy level is Correct. what you're saying. Yeah. Yes. Within no. countries. Yes. So there's no doubt that the nature of government, the political culture uh, within countries really matter. Uh, while resources matter, global institutions and structures and global governance structures matter, the political culture of a particular country also matters. Uh, there's a phenomenon known as the resource curse. Uh, there are studies from Yale, uh, Oxfam, etc., that show that countries that discovered oil or natural resources were more prone to poverty uh, and despotism. Uh, and so to an extent where, I mean, in Sri Lanka, I, I don't want us to discover oil, though we're exploring it. <laughs> that would be the death knell. Because the moment resources are discovered, it creates incentives for the, the criminals uh, to, and, and, and the military to usurp power, uh, to use the contracts they get into with multinationals all over the world uh, to actually pay for guns and armies that suppress and oppress their populations and keep themselves well off. That's what the junta in Myanmar did for a very long time. Uh, very creditably, the US resisted that. Uh, but Singapore and China and India cooperated with it and kept them going for, for a long period of time. So addressing political culture is something we can do from a global level, but as I said, we can't do it when when human rights and labor standard issues are transactionally done. We, they need more global integrity. So we need countries like the United States to actually change the way in which they champion those things. Uh, but we also need people to go into these countries, get involved in their governments, get involved in their businesses, in their policy making, uh, and work for change. We need to stop bringing the cleverest people in poor countries and giving them the good life in California. <laughs> uh, and if we do that, we must bring the poorest as well and be fair about it. Uh, because that brain drain certainly does not help uh, the, the, the situation because people who are most likely to have resisted and made change uh, end up being lured into uh, a more comfortable life in richer countries under current immigration rules which are so selectively and unfairly sort of structured. And there are many organizations, Human Rights Watch has impacts by going in and highlighting, you know, giving information, simply getting word of injustices out brings about change because those in power become embarrassed for what's been revealed about their policies. Um, major impacts in human rights from international justice ministries has had the same effect or um, land rights um, policy change. So there are some very good examples of system level impacts from the outside by putting the right kind of pressure and law reform on countries. We've run, why don't we take one more question and then we are all here and available for people to come up afterwards individually as well as um, Nathan and Nishan will be available tomorrow. So one more, Kimmy, all right. Over on this side, please. To follow up on your question, is the extreme inequality and poverty that we see in the United States a direct result of the relative power of the rich and the middle and lower classes in this country? And, or is it the result of um, the market being sovereign and that we have to accept whatever consequences that the market gives us and try to deal with it as individuals. And um, what implications does your answer, yes or, or either way, have for Christians and people of moral responsibility? I can, uh, okay. There's a phenomenal misunderstanding of what what is meant by free market. Um, it would be better actually if we 
if you come to my talk tomorrow and we discuss afterwards and you raise this kind of question. Uh, it is true that all over the world people are in prison so that markets can be free. But notice how we talk of markets in anthropomorphic terms as if they were some kind of creature or person, uh, which they are not. Uh, markets are not free because you leave things to themselves. Things to themselves, left to themselves, become monopolistic, uh, become non-competitive. The free market is something that needs to be maintained with intense effort. So as, if you're an economist, you understand that the conditions of free market are extremely hard to pertain. It means no information asymmetries. It means perfect competition. Uh, uh, you know, homogeneous production. Uh, it, 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 we don't actually have a free market, but when popularly we talk about free market, we mean leaving things alone, not interfering. The last thing you can do if you want a free market, I would say, is to leave things alone. Because the, the, the way things flow, they don't flow towards a free market. They flow towards a market that's very unfree in an economist definition of free. But like the word rational, economists use the word free to mean something very particular. And in popular culture, we take it and think that economists are talking about freedom in a real sense. And we'll discuss the question of freedom as well tomorrow. For more information about the Veritas Forum, including additional recordings and a calendar of upcoming events, please visit our website at veritas.org.